This lecture will, will expand on a theme introduced in the postlude to our first series, A Pure and Remote View, in which I spend 10 minutes or so near the beginning uh, arguing that the great achievements of the Song monochrome, ink monochrome landscape painting, uh, which are exemplified at their finest in works by Xia Gui and the Chan or Zen masters, Mu Qi and Yu Zhen, are scarcely carried on in post-Song China, but are taken up instead in Japan by Seshu and others, and made the basis for a great Japanese development of Suiboku Sanzui, or ink monochrome landscape. This lecture will expand on that observation and especially will show and discuss in its entirety a 22-leaf album by Seshu of landscapes in late Song styles, an album that has mysteriously been ignored by Seshu scholars, although its whereabouts is known. A recent article published in the March 2012 issue of Art Bulletin by Yukio Lippet, who teaches Japanese art at Harvard, uh, deals with Seshu's best-known haboku or splash ink landscape, the one in the Tokyo National Museum, in great length and detail in a long and well-argued and well-documented article. My contribution in this lecture will be far more modest, mostly just calling attention to this album, which Lippitt doesn't include among his many illustrations, and offering some thoughts on its significance for the big question of Seshu's transformation of style from one that's very close to the Chinese models to one that I would venture to call more Japanese. And what I mean by that is the question that I will raise without ever quite answering in this lecture. First image, please. As I've related in other lectures, I spent a lot of time in Japan during my active years, usually a month or so every year or more. Uh, during the period before uh, in the early 1980s, we U.S. citizens were able to go to China. And I took on research projects in Japanese painting, especially those in which I could make a contribution as a Chinese painting specialist who could also do research in Japanese painting because of his language ability, his easy movement in Japanese art circles, and his familiarity with both traditions. Next. During my Fulbright year in Kyoto in 1953 to 4, I developed a great enthusiasm for the artist Tomioka Tessai, who had died in 1924, so that I never knew him, but whose works were still to be seen all over, along with people who had known him and could talk about him. Next. This is a landscape with rainstorm that Tomioka Tessai painted in, the, in 1905, and it reveals not only why I was and am so enthusiastic about Tessai, but also why I believe that his paintings had a profound effect on 20th century artists in China who knew his works well from reproductions and originals. I believe that the great passion that recent Chinese painters have had for dark, inky landscape paintings was inspired largely by the work of Tessai, and that they also adopted other important things from his paintings. But that's an argument to make and illustrate in another lecture. Next. My 1972 exhibition of Japanese Nanga, or Southern School paintings, a kind of Japanese painting until then little known outside Japan, was one product of this enthusiasm. Another was my book-length study of the early Japanese artist Sasaki Hyokusen, concentrating on how he introduced important features of Ming Ching painting styles to Japanese painting. But that, too, will be the subject of another lecture. Next. One of the lectures in this series has already been devoted to four Nanga albums, and another one will follow up by presenting Nanga paintings in other forms, such as this great winter landscape by Uragami Gokudo, a registered national treasure in Japan. Next. Part of the attraction of Nanga painting lies in its artist's creative and individual uses of the medium of ink monochrome, as seen in these two remarkable paintings, Gokudo's and The Fishing at Night by Yosa Busan, a great artist to whose works I'll certainly devote a whole lecture. Now all of this leads up to my saying that the tradition of ink monochrome painting in Japan, called suiboku ga in Japanese, has been an area in which I've been deeply and passionately engaged. And behind that passion lies always the question, how did it derive from and how did it make itself independent of 
the Chinese tradition of ink monochrome landscape as it was originated and developed in China, reaching, as I said, its great height of achievement in the Southern Song period. Next. Old attempts to define the difference between Chinese and Japanese painting, such as the one made by Robert Treat Payne in his basic Pelican book on Japanese art history, written, written together with Alexander Soper, who wrote on its architecture. Uh, these old books sometimes oppose, apply the word decorative to Chi Japanese painting, opposing it to something like philosophical for Chinese painting. I'm certainly not introducing those terms as something that I entirely agree with, but they represent serious attempts to deal with this large and important problem in East Asian art studies. And that problem underlies some of what I'll be talking about in this lecture. The characterization of Japanese painting as decorative, I used to argue, was a kind of unintended put-down, because that word tends to demean the works that it's applied to, as in merely decorative. Most people aren't enough aware of the great Japanese tradition of decorative painting from the early hand scrolls, such as the Tale of Genji picture scrolls, Genji Monogatari Emaki seen here, to the great screen paintings and others by artists of the Rinpo school, the two major masters being Tawaraya Sotatsu, details from two of his screens seen here, the rocks and waves at Matsushima screens in the Freer Gallery, and his thunder and wind gods, pair of twofold screens, seen at the right, next, and his equally great follower, Ogata Korin. This is the right screen from his pair of white and red blossoming plum trees growing by a stream. I haven't any plans for a lecture on them because I've never done serious work on them, and I introduce them here in these unsharp images just to call your attention to them as I talk about large developments in Japanese painting. Next. A few artists with the late 16th, early 17th century master Hasegawa Tohaku prominent among them, a few artists were able to move smoothly between the two stylistic modes or traditions. In the great old days of my early studies in Japan with Shimada, one could view the pines and fog screens by him at the Kyoto National Museum and then walk across the street, uh, Higashi Yamadori that is, to enter an unguarded temple building, switch on the light, and stay there as long as you wanted to gaze at the great Fusuma, or sliding door paintings, of blossoming plum trees and flowers, seen here. I've shown several times in these lectures this hauntingly beautiful pair of screens by Tohaku, representing pine trees seen in fog, because they are, for me, among the most moving works in all of world art. And here they are again. The images I have were not made from the original screens, but are pulled off the internet, which means that they're a bit blurry. But that only drops another thin layer of fog, so to speak, between us and the trees, and it isn't so damaging as it sometimes can be. Anyway, I've used this long introduction to get us back to the main topic of this lecture, the great change in Sestru style from an early close adherence to Chinese styles to a later move into the paintings that seem to me instrumental in inaugurating the Japanese ink painting tradition, as separate from that of China. Of course, for a really serious treatment of this subject, other Muromachi period Tsuiboku artists would have to be brought in, as I used to do in lecturing on this subject in my Japanese art classes. The video lecture medium requires some radical shortening and simplifying of big art historical issues and developments. Next. So now at last, back to Seshu. Before continuing with the main matter of this lecture, I will play again, for those of you who haven't watched it, the passage in the postlude to the earlier lecture series in which I introduced Seshu, his trip to China, and the paintings he did after coming back. Anybody who doesn't want to watch and listen to this again can fast forward for about nine minutes. I ended Lecture 12, the last proper lecture in this series, by showing this fan-shaped painting. It's in the Nizu Museum in Tokyo, by the way, and remarking that it was originally in an old issue of Koka magazine, published as a work attributed to Yu Jin, but that more recently it's been published in Japan as an early work of the Japanese painter Seshu. I won't try to resolve that contradiction, but I'll only point out that it illustrates a real connection. Seshu went to China with a diplomatic mission in 1467, 
and he stayed there for two years, returning to Japan in 1469. While he was in China, he studied Sung paintings that he was able to see there. Along with some later painting, he didn't, he didn't have a lot of respect for Ming painting. He names one artist, as I remember, and nobody can even identify him, whom he really admired. But anyway, but he came back uh, to Japan, able to make quite fine imitations of Sung styles, the styles of Ma Yuan and Xia Gui, styles of Yu Zhen and others. Before I go on to that, however, let me just make the comment. Here is two, two works by the uh, uh, Ming Dynasty artist, 15th century artist Dai Jin, uh, worked in the academy, famous artist of the time. We'll discuss at great length in my book on early and middle Ming painting, uh, Parting at the Shore. Okay, anyway, but apart from that, this picture is in the, boss, uh, the picture at the left is in the Shanghai Museum, and it's um, a Dai Jin work uh, with an inscription in the sky by Dong Xi Chang. Anyway, leaving that aside, this is about as close as anybody in Ming China comes to continuing the Southern Song uh, ink monochrome landscape style, mist among the trees and trees and houses among the trees and so on. In other words, Dai Jin a major artist like this could do it, but it was not at all popular, and uh, it's very hard to find. You cannot find much continuation, or really any serious continuation of this kind of Southern Song ink monochrome landscape in China, in the Yuan or, or early Ming. Uh, it, was sub, it was supplanted by very different kinds of painting, as represented by the Dai Jin painting on the right, uh, in which the forms are large, and prominent and equal in value over the whole painting, not much sense of real space, not much sense of real distance, and uh, strongly locked together. Okay, I won't go into all that, but anyway, something very different. So uh, it is scarce, can scarcely be said to be continued in China at all. On the other hand, next please. In Japan, Seshu and his followers uh, created a quite wonderful school of ink painting uh, suiboku in Japanese, based on his studies in China. When he came back for a while, he was painting in a style closely, uh, closely dependent on what he had seen and studied in China and what he had brought back, sketches or copies. And then he moved from that into styles more, more his own. Okay, there is one leaf from a landscape album by Seshu, which for some reason I've never understood has been ignored by Seshu scholars and by everybody. It's reproduced in an old, very fine reproduction book from which these slides are made. Um, the collection is known, the album is known, but for some reason they choose to ignore it. Other leaves are in the style of Xia Gui and uh, Ma Yuan and indicate how closely Seshu was able to imit imitate these Southern Song painters when he came back from China. This one is obviously in the style of Yu Zhen and has the people in a boat in the left here and the ragged shoreline and strokes of rough strokes of dark ink indicating the rocks and trees uh, and a, a hill up above and then houses here at the lower right. And here, just a moment, here another painting of the same, in the same album by Seshu. Well, these are quite fine and interesting and um, as I say, indicates that Seshu really took this style seriously and was going to do something new with it, and in fact did go on to do something new with it. Here, this is a painting I think owned by a dealer in Japan, Seshu. Uh, the, the, somebody in the boat very simply represented trees on the shore and uh, houses and so on. Signed work of Seshu with a seal. Uh, this is still close to the Eugen Manor, but then as he goes on, he uh, departs from it. This is a uh, from a painting by Seshu, I believe either Cleveland or Seattle, Seattle I think, anyway, bought by Sherman Lee, uh, and um, I think I think a, a reliable work of Seshu, with houses and fishermen and trees on, on the bluff and the distant hill. Okay, quite fine. And then here, next. Now then, when we come to this one, this is a detail of the lower part of a very famous painting. This is the great Seshu Haboku uh, landscape uh, in the Tokyo National Museum, dated 1495. It's um, national treasure, and should be. A long inscription at the top. He went to China, as I say, and came back 
claiming he found no Chinese artists there he really could learn much from. He names one of them who nobody's ever identified, but basically he just didn't, didn't learn from artists. He did learn a lot, however, from paintings. And he came back, and then, after a time of imitating it fairly directly, he went on to turn it into a, uh, a new style, a, and a specifically Japanese style. Now, what we mean by saying Japanese is a big problem, and it's one that I've been occupied with throughout my, much of my career. I've written and, very, and lectured a lot on it uh, my, on my website, CLP, KO Lectures and Papers, number 120, about Sestru and Sesson has a long section on it, and other other things uh, of that sort. How his transformation of the Chinese splashed ink manner can be read as a Japan Japanization of the style. Um, okay, the next uh, detail. As you can see, he uh, be, puts more emphasis on the brushstroke as brushstroke, right on the surface, not as particularly evocative, but as uh, somehow powerful and uh, interesting in itself. Or here, the lower part with the uh, house and the, uh, uh, the, the uh, flag and the two people in the boat. Uh, okay, this is quite, quite a wonderful painting and, as I say, moving into a whole school of Japanized or Japanese ink monochrome landscape, suiboku. Okay, that's beyond our subject, certainly. I put it on only to show that where the Chinese, for whatever reason, did not continue this style or develop from it in their painting. The Japanese did. They took it up. I've, I was using this as an example of why the Chinese have a certain habit of doing something marvelously well and then stopping. <laughs> I gave several examples of that. Okay. And where it was taken up by others. Uh, the next, please. Two paintings from Korea from the 15th, 16th century. And... Uh, I do not know much about Korean painting, and I'm not going to try to talk about it. But in a paper I gave last October, I was suggesting that Korean masters of this period may, uh, may very well have, uh, should be credited more than they have been as continuing the Southern Song, uh, Mao Yuan and so forth, Mao Yuan, Xia Gui, and other uh, landscape styles. And um, our uh, writers on them have tended to emphasize more their relationship to Ming painting, whereas I think that what might be rep might be credited instead is what they have learned from Southern Song painting and continue in a way that is similar to Suiboku uh, painting in Japan. Well, this uh, this paper of mine had rather the wrong uh, response. It was seen as a, or taken as a criticism of two very fine elder scholars who are good old friends, one of them a student of mine, uh, who, uh, for their not having uh, recognized what I was now preaching, I didn't mean that at all. I have the greatest respect for them, and I was only suggesting kind of new area of, of pursuit. In talking about Sishu in China, I forgot that he did name one identifiable Chinese artist of his time whom he admired. This was the Zhou schoolmaster Li Zai, whose landscape in the Tokyo National Museum is now on screen. And, um, change please, he paints a few works uh, as a kind of overseas just schoolmaster, like these four landscapes of the seasons. But he doesn't continue as that. Instead, he continues in the direction that I take to be the creation of a specifically Japanese style. Sestru's work is followed by a great development of ink monochrome painting, including landscape and misty scenes in Japan. I put on to represent them two screens by Hatsugawa Tohaku, born 1539, died in 1610, who admired Sesshu and studied with one of his disciples, but who also studied Chinese paintings that he was able to see and learn from. The screens at top are obviously inspired by the two side pieces of Muchi's great Daitokuji triptych. At the left, the bamboo grove and crane, without the crane, uh, and the next, and at the right, the mother gibbon and child with the father, one assumes the father, added. Um, below are Tohaku's great screens of pine trees and mist, one of the masterworks of Japanese painting and one of the most evocative and moving paintings in all of world art. I remember very well coming upon a row of pines while climbing in Huangshan uh, that reminded me of Tohaku's screens.
and I not only photographed them, but waited for more fog to come in and envelop them so I could capture this image to put beside the Tohaku screens, as I'm doing now. Now, continuing, I'm going to show some Seshu paintings and discuss the questions they raise about their Chinese models in this part one, before we turn to the album that is our main subject in part two. Next. Seshu painted a number of Chan or Zen figure paintings, including this well-known one of a subject we're familiar with from the Chinese examples, that is the first Chan patriarch, Bodhidharma, facing the wall of a cave in meditation, and his disciple, the second patriarch, Hui Ke, approaching him and offering his cut-off left hand as proof of his sincerity, an extreme act that finally broke Bodhidharma's long withdrawal from the world and human society. Next. We're familiar with the subject from Liang Kai's depiction of it, one of a series of pictures of Chan patriarchs and their disciples in landscape settings, making up a hand scroll in the Shanghai Museum. Next. We also saw briefly in a previous lecture this detail from an anonymous Sung period hanging scroll showing the same encounter in the Cleveland Museum of Art. I could also show, but I don't have the image handy, a version by the Ming artist Dai Jin in a hand scroll that he painted. Seshu may have seen both Sung period and Ming period pictures of Zen themes such as this and made copies of them to bring back. Next. Some of Seshu's landscape paintings, such as this one, are in a softer manner and feature a band of fog stretching across the base of the further hills or mountains, as this one does. Japanese writers on Seshu have made the point that this landscape element appears to originate with the Yuan period master Gao Kogong, who is a scholar official artist serving in the Mongol administration along with Zhao Mengfu and others. They take this as evidence that Seshu knew about and imitated scholar amateur painting in China as well as professional painting. Or in other words, using the terminology invented by Yung Chi Chang, uh, Seshu came into contact uh, with Southern School painting as well as Northern School. I've intended for a long time to write something arguing against this idea and pointing out that by the time Seshu went to China, this feature of landscape style had been adopted and absorbed by the Zhou School, the Academy, and other professional masters, and it was no longer the, in use only by the amateurs. Let me quickly show some paintings that illustrate this development. Next. Here is Gao Kagong's well-known hanging scroll landscape of hills and fog, which he painted in 1309. It's in the National Palace Museum in Taipei, and it was in the Chinese Art Treasures Exhibition, number 70. It's the most familiar work of the artist, and it displays this device of concealing the base of the main mountain in fog so as to increase its sense of height. Next. And here is a short hand scroll by Gao Kagong, badly damaged, with some parts missing, but still readable as a picture, painted by Gao Kagong in 1300. This little-known picture, which is in the Palace Museum, Beijing, I reproduced with my section on Yuan painting in the 3,000 Years book for its figure 144, and it uses the same device effectively to separate near and far. Next. The same is true of this anonymous Yuan period hand scroll in the old collection of the Freer Gallery of Art, which I discovered there as a neglected and unpublished work and reproduced in my Hills Beyond a River book, or its figure 20. It's a fine, evocative painting, preserving some elements of the great splashed ink landscapes of the late Tsung period, the best known being those uh, attributed to Bu Qi and Bai Yujin. Next, there are quite a few more I could show. Here's a leaf from the Hikoen album, identified by its signature as the work of a certain Gao Li, who was active at the beginning of the Ming. Next. True enough that the motive of hills rising above the fog continues to be seen also in works by scholar amateur or literati artists. Here's a leaf from the great 1482 album by Shunjo that was the main subject of uh, an earlier lecture. Shunjo draws freely on a diversity of stylistic traditions in that way anticipating the practice of fang or creative imitation as it was later to be developed uh, in the Ming Dynasty by Dong Chi Chang and his followers. Next. Another leaf from Shunzhou's album 
in a manner not clearly derived from any particular older master. The band of fog at the base of the hills had by then become a motive uh, in general use, not by any means limited to the scholar amateurs or southern school painters, as this long series is meant to demonstrate. Next. We find it, for instance, in several of the paintings in a scroll discovered in a tomb at a place called Huayan in southern Zhejiang province, in which two scrolls of painting were found in the sleeves of the man buried there. This will be the main subject of an old article of mine that has somehow gone unpublished until now and will soon appear in the Archives of Asian Art. Without going into my argument at length, one of the scrolls is made up of quickly painted pictures by major professional artists active in the capital and in the Imperial Academy, whose preserved works are mainly impressive hanging scrolls, but who are now revealed to have also painted simple, sketchy pictures to give to people, probably in exchange for small gifts. This one is by an artist of, the ki of this kind named Ho Chung. Next. And this one by another academy master named Xie Huan. Hills and Clouds pictures carried symbolic messages when presented to scholar officials, praising them for bringing benefits to the people they administered, just as the clouds and rains bring benefits to farmers. But leaving aside this matter of meaning, which belonged to another lecture, the point I'm making is that by this time, or by the time Sishu went to China, this landscape motif of a band of fog stretching across the base of middle or far ground hills or mountains was commonly used by the professional and just schoolmasters, some of them associated with the Imperial Academy, artists of the kind that Sechu came into contact with. So that Sechu's use of it certainly doesn't in itself demonstrate any contact with scholar amateur painters nor does anything else in Sessu's works, to my knowledge. Next. Another motif that Sessu has taken from the Chinese paintings that he saw, Song and later, is that of two men sitting hunched over, facing each other. It appears commonly in his paintings. Sometimes the two men are seen in a boat. We could find quite a few occurrences of it in Southern Sung painting. I'll show one of these in the great Xiaogui pure and remote view later in this lecture. For now, a notable example that most of you probably remember next is this signed fan painting by Ma Yuan in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, in which the two men are seated under a blossoming plum tree, the arching branches of which frame them overhead. I once wrote about these two men as, quote, like a pair of parentheses enclosing nothing, end quote. Next. A work by Seshu that is considered by most Japanese to be his finest surviving work it's the so-called Long Scroll, or Chokan, a hand scroll owned by the Mori family in Yamaguchi on the southern coast of the main island of Japan, Honshu. Painted in 1486, it's about 40 feet long. What is not usually recognized in the many writings about it is that it's based loosely, probably by way of some Ming copy, on the great Xiaogui pure and remote view. Here, for instance, is the section showing a stretch of water leading up to the Great Cliff. Next. Before I talk about that scroll, however, let me relate briefly how I missed seeing it in the original. The same Mori family also owns, along with other paintings, a pair of fine hanging scroll landscapes with figures by the Ming master Dai Jin. These had been published by Suzuki K, and he arranged for me to see them, contacting the Mori family and making the arrangement or the appointment for a certain day. Richard Vinograd and I, seen here in the familiar photograph, made a leisurely trip by train, together with a student of mine named Margaret Louise Hollingsworth, who was working on a dissertation on Sesson, which she never finished, alas. She had personal problems that worked against her high intelligence and her sensitivity to art. Anyway, we traveled for several days around the coast, starting at a point north of Kyoto, arriving at Yamaguchi a day before our appointment, or so I thought, having somehow got the date wrong. We spent a day in Yamaguchi seeing sights and resting, and at the day end of the day, I phoned the Mori family about our appointment, only to find that it had been for that day. They had brought the long Seshu scroll from storage so we could see it, but had sent it back when we didn't come. 
We did spend much of the following day with them, and we saw the Daijin paintings and other things, but we missed what most Japanese would consider the chance of a lifetime, to unroll the great Seshu scroll ourselves and enjoy it close up, not under glass. Next. It's highly unlikely that Seshu saw the original Xiaogui painting. Uh, many free copies of it were made in the early Ming period, and Seshu's scroll resembles those far more than it does Xiaogui's original. I don't have images of any of those at hand, as I probably would if I were treating Seshu's scroll seriously. I'll only show a few loose comparisons to bring out the relationship in a general way. Next. Japanese writings on the scroll praise it as a profound visual exploration of nature, but to my eyes it offers much less of that than uh, Shagwe's original. Seshu's scroll moves unrealistically through four seasons in a single continuous space. He uses heavier outlines, flattens forms that were originally rendered volumetrically, such as the cliff itself, enlarges secondary elements such as trees, buildings, boats, and so forth, in a way that further reduces the monumentality of the landscape masses, and in general produces an entertaining, lively picture that is anything but a pure and remote view, to my eyes at least. I don't mean to put it down excessively, it's just a very different kind of painting. Next. You will remember in a passage that follows the Great Cliff in the scroll, a cave in the cliff face with two tiny figures sitting face to face. They were in the upper right of this detail. Seshu, following, as I said, some Ming free copy of the Shagwe scroll, makes them large and provides an easy access to their cave. Generally, motifs that required some looking to discover in their original pure and remote setting of the Sung original become anecdotal and entertaining in the hands of Seshu. He does, to be sure, capture well the treatment of rock surfaces and the creation of rocky masses in a way that surely impressed his Japanese viewers, since nothing of the kind had been seen in Japanese painting before. Next. Xiao Gui, in a further point in his scroll seen here in a close-up detail, presents a simple village with several thatched roof buildings, one of them an inn with two people seen inside it and another arriving with his donkey. The comparable scene in Seshu's scroll is a bustling scene with a throng of people outside the inn and others passing through an outdoor gateway to climb an ascending road up the mountain. Next. A final section of the Seshu scroll. We have to remember in making such judgmental comparisons that Seshu is working from a later copy and using his own creative powers to create a work, to produce a work that indeed has its own kind of monumentality and depth. And his is a different age. One no longer is concerned with the pursuit of naturalistic imagery. A Sung period artist would not have allowed the beginnings of a huge overhanging cliff, as we see it at the right of this section, to be succeeded so closely afterwards by a receding stream and the roof of a tingza or kiosk seen above fog. They don't belong together in a landscape composed of naturalistic forms and spaces. But that didn't trouble the Japanese viewer of Seshu's time or later nor, properly speaking, is there any reason why they should trouble us. Elements of the late Song Chinese manner, as transmuted by some Ming imitator, have been further transmuted into what is now a Japanese painting. And with that, we return to my original problem. What do we mean by speaking of Japanese painting, as in the end profoundly different from Chinese painting, even though they can come close together at times? Next. Let's look at a few of Seshu's copies of Sung fan paintings. He did a number of these, identifying the artist of the original for most of them. They are among his best-known landscapes. Fortunately, we have the original for one of these, the painting I showed at the end of the uh, Pure and Remote series, as attributed to Eugen. Next. And here is Seshu's free copy of it, labeled in the lower right, Eugen done in, a more, in more prominent brushstrokes that lie more on the surface, where the, orig or the original can scarcely be said to exhibit brushwork at all, and its forms recede into atmospheric depth. The volumetric treatment of the hillside is impressive, especially in this comparison. Sestra was no doubt capable of a more faithful copy if he had chosen to do that, 
He signs his copy with his own name, but writes Eugen below it to the right. Next. I bring back this detail from an album leaf by the Ming artist Chu Ying, shown several times before, just to remind you that fan-shaped paintings by Southern Song artists, originally mounted on flat fans and then preserved in albums, were especially valued by Ming collectors. Many of the finest works we have by the Southern Song masters are in this form. Sessu absorbed this Ming fondness for them and did free copies of a number of them that are preserved among his works. Next. This is his copy of a Xia Gui fan, one that unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. At least I don't know of it. It was one of those late Song landscape compositions with a heavy overhanging cliff in the upper part. A roadway leads below it with a traveler under an umbrella on it, making his way toward the gateway seen in the distance against the darkened sky. One can imagine the original Xiaogui from similar compositions by him and others, but the only Xiaogui winter landscape I know is, next, this fan-shaped album leaf that I showed in the lecture on him, 11C, a signed work with a returning farmer or fisherman crossing a bridge and approaching his house. The trees, at least, are similar. Next. Sashu also, probably later, reworked the composition into a hanging scroll as one of an autumn and winter pair, of which is, is, this is the winter scene. It's plate four in the big Sashu volume. It would appear that Sashu's sketches after paintings he saw in China served him as sources for quite a few later works until he moved into a situation of independence from these Chinese sources in his later work. Next. This is another Sessu copy of a Xiaogui fan painting, again one for which the original no longer exists. In this one, our familiar old traveler, walking with a staff and followed by his boy servant, enters the picture in lower left on a path that continues zigzagging past leafy trees and between rocky masses and through a foggy middle ground to reach a temple of which the roof is seen beyond. It's a familiar southern Chung theme, and again one can imagine a fine Xiaogui painting behind it, the movement back into depth from strongly shaped and textured rock masses to a hilltop with scant vegetation, and beyond that to distant peaks seen only in silhouette. A good living Chinese painter could virtually recreate the original. <laughs> I say that with some trepidation. In today's China, the painting that I imagine is all too likely to turn up in a forthcoming Beijing auction, the product of a forger who watches my lectures. Next. Finally for this series, this is a fan-shaped painting by Sessu reproduced in an exhibition catalog. I have no idea where it is. He doesn't write the name of the artist who painted the original, but from the subject and style, we can guess at Maoyuan. A heavily robed and hooded man has come out into the cold in early spring to see the first blooming of his plum trees. This is a familiar subject in Southern Sung and later painting, signifying the idea of continuing vigor in old age, the man like the tree experiencing a new awakening with the coming of spring. Once more, one could virtually recreate the original, but please don't. Next. Finally, before we turn in part two to the album that is our centerpiece, I show once more uh, two of the haboku, or splashed ink landscapes, that led up to Sessu's great and famous work of 1495. Whether or not an actual date, I don't know, but an ideal chronology based on style. This horizontal painting signed by Sessu, which I believe was owned by a Tokyo dealer, still preserves quite a lot of the Yujian manner, forms blurring at a space for an effect of real scenery seen through atmosphere. Next. In this one, the broad brush strokes are becoming more self-sufficient, so to speak, less evocative of the landscape masses that they supposedly stand for. Sessu seems to be moving into the style seen at its finest in the great Haboku landscape of 1495. Next. Here's an image of the whole of that and the inscription made from a reproduction. The painting was done for Sessu's pupil So En, and the inscription is long and informative, but it doesn't concern us now, and I want to show the details from the pictures below that I made myself long ago. Next. And what these details reveal clearly is a great change. The composition and the elements that make it up 
remain much the same. Leafy trees on a steep knoll by the shore, roofs of buildings below seen over a fence, one of them an inn identified by the flag protruding above it, now reduced to a diagonal line and a small stroke sticking out from it. Two men in a boat near the shore, and a taller vertical cliff simply indicated above and beyond. All these are by now so familiar to Seshu's viewing audience that they can be rendered in this way, perfunctory and yet powerful, and be drawn together in the visual perception of his audience into a scene with real masses and atmospheric space. But the brushstrokes, besides continuing to function representationally in this way, also have taken on more of near independence, a kind of self-sufficiency that encourages the viewer's eye to see them as the products of an ink-loaded brush moving in a certain way over a piece of paper. And we are back to the observation that I made at the end of the first of the Pure and Remote View series in looking at a small painting on silk from Changsha. I observed that a line or a stroke made by the brush can take on a certain independence from its representational function, even while it remains part of a picture. That double or ambivalent nature of the brush stroke has gone very far here, and, let me say it at last, raises the big question that underlies this lecture. It has taken on a character that we can recognize as a move into a specifically Japanese style. There now, I've said it, and I can go on to our main subject, a major but unrecognized, virtually ignored, Seshu landscape album. This will occupy us during most of part two of this long lecture. So for now, I conclude with this one, James Cahill. <laughs>